So it's a great pleasure to, to have Minha Kuang uh, from RIKEN to give uh, this joint CIS and RIKEN AI talks. Um, Min is a, is, is a unit leader at RIKEN IIT where he leads the functional analytic learning unit. He received his PhD degree in mathematics from Brown University with Steven Smell. Uh, before joining AIP, he was a researcher at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova. His current research focuses on functional analytic and geometrical methods in machine learning and statistics. Um, Minth will be talking about um, regularized information geometric and optimal transport distances between covariance operators and Gaussian processes today. And without further ado, thank you, uh, take it away, Min. Well, thank you very much, Volkan, for the introduction. So uh, I will talk, but today I will talk about the distances between SRS and concept, covariance operators and functional processes. Can you hear me well? I think I don't care. I think you can hear me well. So the, the talk will be on the generalization of the, uh, the chemistry of the following geometric structures for Gaussian measures in Iran, uh, to infinite dimensional Gaussian measures and Gaussian processes. So we'll talk about some of the Riemannian distances and uh, the divergences and optimal transfer distances. We'll talk a little bit about maybe talk a little bit about the conditions and unifying formulations. Um, so kind of uh, this kind of more like a chronological. So this kind of talk, uh, this is the book I did like a couple of years ago, and then this uh, kind of um, more like a basic work. So very briefly, we have like the motivation for this study. There's a lot of work on the symmetric structures, the pressure measures on on Euclidean uh, space and uh, symmetric uh, positive definite matrices. So they play a essential role in statistics and probability and machine learning, and they have like, a lot of practical applications: so brain imaging, computer vision. Radio signal processing, brain uh, computer processes, etc. So that's actually this is a huge, uh, this is a huge topic. There's a lot, there's a lot of work and a lot of a lot of theory and a lot of applications. So now, uh, uh, what we just talked about, like a few things, just talk about. Like, let's uh, first talk about some of the uh, Riemannian distances. So the fisher round matrix. So consider the set of Gaussian densities on our end. So this is. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, yeah. so a Gaussian density uh, with zero mean is characterized completely. So it's given by this formula here. The density is given by this formula here, and it's uh, completely characterized by its um, covariance uh, matrix sigma theta here. So sigma theta is a matrix, uh, it's an n-band matrix, it's a matrix, uh, positive definite matrix. So it's given by its, uh, so we can parameterize it by a set uh, theta, and since uh, it's a symmetric, so it, it, given, it has size n by n, but we just need to go to kind of the uh, to parameterize at the upper half of the, uh, of, the, of the matrix. So it has n times n plus one of the two parameters. So this is, a, we can um, parameterize by a set data here in, um, in a Euclidean space, and it's an open, it's an open set. So it, says, uh, it has a structure of a smooth manifold, and we can define the Fisher information. Uh, information matrix is given by this formula here. So this is actually a very uh, a well known. Uh, um, you know, uh, 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 quantity in, in, in information geometry. And so this, uh, in this case, it defines the Riemannian matrix on, on S, so, uh, the so-called fisher Rao matrix, official information matrix. And for this, uh, in the case of the Gaussian density, we can, of course, we can actually, we can compute this explicitly. So it's a central element in information geometry, and we have an explicit expression for it. It's given by this formula here. And because we, because we have the correspondence between uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Gaussian density with zero mean and the, uh, the symmetric positive definite matrix via the covariance matrix. So we can also have a, uh, we have also, a, we, we have the fisher matrix corresponding to something called the affine invariant matrix on, on the set of uh, symmetric positive definite matrices. So it's given by this formula here. And, and so we have, uh, so with this uh, matrix, you now we have the, the set of, uh, the set of SPD matrices becomes, uh, and then SPD matrices becomes a manifold, a Riemannian manifold. And uh, so it, many things can be done. So this is, this, uh, this is on the affine uh, variable Riemannian matrix has been studied a lot. And we have, we can, we can compute many things explicitly. So for example, we can, um, it's, uh, it's the manifold with negative, uh, not, not positive curvature. So it has a unique geodesic and any uh, matrix A and B. And this uh, geodesic it has a closed form formula. And also, correct, it, it's like it's a Riemannian distance, so it's given also has a closed form formula. So there's a lot of, uh, so basically, it's a, it's a, it's a fisher out, like it's a, 
it's a half, like a half of the fish, fish resistance between two aggression measures on RNA. And uh, so a lot of things have been studied about this. And another one is a simple one, is the low quality metric. So this one is a simple uh, Riemannian metric, and it also has like a unique geodesic joining A and B. So it has a simple form, you know, the geodesic has a simple form, and the Riemannian distance has a simple, uh, a simple expression as well, which is lower than a slightly with the probability norm. And it's faster to compute than the other distance, and it can, one can also be part of the possibility kernels with this distance works from the Gaussian kernels. Because this one is a flat, uh, the manifold under, under the spaceship, the manifold is a flat manifold. And so uh, now let's talk about how we can actually generalize this to the uh, infinite dimension by setting up Gaussian measures on the covariant of Gaussian measures of Hilbert space and the covariance of purpose. So in this case, we have um, infinite, uh, an infinite uh, matrix or an operator. So now for this instance, the infinite dimensional generalization will be substantially different from the finite dimensional formulation. And, and why? Because for the S and SPD matrix, we can the lab A here is the, the principal logarithm of the matrix. So if we have the um, if we have the um, single uh, spectral decomposition of A is written in this form, then we uh, to compute the log of A, we just compute the log of the, uh, the eigenvalues and we multiply them. You, this you uh, very, uh, this matrix you here, which consists of the um, auto, orthogonal um, eigen, autonomous eigenvectors. Now, if A now is an infinite dimension or like positive operator, uh, which is a confidence, confidence operator, for example, then it's a uh, Himmelschmidt operator. So it has infinitely many eigenvalues. So eigenvalues lambda k will go to zero. They will go to zero as k goes to infinity. So then, one of the lambda k will go to infinity and log of lambda k will go to negative infinity. So now in, in, in order to compute these things, you know, so this distance here, we need to compute the, the inverse, okay? then we need to compute the log. So we can see here that with the, uh, uh, with the one of the lambda k go to, uh, going to infinity and log of lambda k goes to negative infinity, so the a inverse will be unbounded, log of a will be unbounded. So we do not, so we do not have a direct generalization to the infinite dimensional setting. So what we can do is let's try to generalize this log really distance for the formula log a minus log b with the forbidden norm uh, to, the, to the infinite dimension of setting with the actual Selvet choice and positive number speed of operators on the inverse space. So we need to do two things. We need to generalize the log, the log, the, the matrix, the principal matrix logarithm, and then we need to generalize the forbidden in the product. And it turned out that the, uh, the Himmelschmidt norm, norm is actually not a sufficient uh, quantity. So first, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the uh, the log function, the the, the the matrix log function. Now, this is actually uh, so it's given by uh, this formula here, where this UK gets in UK, so UK, you dimension of UK to UK transpose. So, yeah. For the finite dimension of setting, except that we have infinitely many of these qualities, and with the log of lambda k goes to negative infinity. So this is unbounded. So what we can do is uh, um, get a, a regularization. We can add like a, we can add like um, gamma i where i is the identity operator, is a, where gamma is greater than zero. So if we do this, then log of lambda k plus gamma is always bounded. So when k goes to infinity, it just goes to log of gamma. So this whole thing is, is bounded, is over, over the local uh, if gamma i is bounded. So, it's, it's. so we, here we solve this problem. So let's move on to the uh, second problem. Now, so now we have log, instead of log a minus log b, we this term, we can consider log of log a plus gamma i minus log of b plus mu i uh, with the inverse mean but the problem is actually uh, this quantity is in general is not finite because uh, the identity operator is not a Hilbert Schmidt operator. So then the uh, because with the Hilbert Schmidt arm here we the identity were just just a trace is uh, just equal to the trace of the identity were just equal to infinity. And so if gamma is not equal to zero, then this quantity the log of uh, the Hilbert Schmidt number log of a plus gamma i square will be equal to infinity. And in particular, the distance between like the two uh, multiples of the identity of the surface will be equal to infinity. And so to, to resolve this, the, the, uh, the resolution of this is actually is, is something called the extended Hilbert-Schmidt norm. So it was introduced by Lara Tunga in 2007. So instead of the identity operator, uh, we define this uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm as uh, uh, extended Hilbert-Schmidt norm 
to be here in the norm square of a plus gamma i square is equal to the Hilbert-Schmidt norm square of a plus gamma square, along with the extended Hilbert-Schmidt inner product. So it is defined in this way so that the scalar operators gamma i is the, are orthogonal to the Hilbert-Schmidt operators. And so if we define it like this, then uh, the, identity, the, the norm, the extended Hilbert-Schmidt norm identity operator is equal to one. So it's uh, something we call it the kind of the, a form of compactification. Because instead of infinity, we actually compactify so that it's equal to one. So this is actually a Hilbert, this is now, uh, okay, so, so the generalization of the, the set of SPD by genus time by n to the infinite dimensional set is actually Hilbert manifold. So it's actually the set of form, instead of just A, we have the form A plus gamma I, the pattern zero where A star is equal to A, and A is the Hilbert Schmidt, so A star equal to A zero subject joint. And uh, so we recover if A is subject joint and the, the Hilbert Schmidt norm square just equal to the summation of the eigen value square. So a lot of that uh, generalize the um, affine invariant remaining metric. And so uh, the tangent spread is just a set of uh, over symmetric subject joint standard in the Schmidt operator, and then the remaining metric just given by this formula here. And the distance is actually quite similar. So the distance is quite similar to the paradigmatic phase, except that we, instead of A and B, we have A gamma I plus B, uh, B plus U I, and instead of the uh, combination norm, we have the extended in the Schmidt norm. So this is uh, the, the setting for the uh, generalization of the affine value of the remaining metric. And we can do this for the log of Hilbert Schmidt uh, for the log of the metric as well. So we can, instead of the uh, log of A minus log B, we can have this uh, distance log of this command, this could be this new I with edges. And uh, we can compute this for the log of Hilbert Schmidt in the product. So this actually, uh, with, with this, uh, something called the log of Hilbert Schmidt metric, we, have, we also have, like, as in the same case of the log of the metric, we also have a flat uh, remanding uh, many, uh, a flat remanding manifold. And all quantities are going to be, to be finite because of the extended, because of we do the regularization. So there are two things. We do the regularization and then we do the extended and the speed um, norm. So now there are, so of course, so these distances are kind of abstract distances called uh, liquid abstract operators. So there are at least two ways to, 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 to compute them concretely in, in, in practice. Not talking about the, uh, the, phase, uh, the, the two phases that inform the Reproducing Tony Hilbert's basis of IPHS methodology. The first one is the distances and diverges between IPHS covariance operators. And the second one, which I will talk about later on, is the distances and diverges between Gaussian processes and covariance operators of stochastic processes. Uh, and they both involve uh, IPHS methodology. So, okay, I will, I will be quick on this one because this is both from I did some years ago. So now, so let's talk about the first setting of RPHS covariance operator. So if we have a positive definite kind of K and a corresponding RPHS HK, then there's a canonical feature map phi that map X uh, to HK. So we have uh, phi X equal to KX. Okay, it is given by this formula here. And so let's assume, so the, the product in HK of phi X would be Y just equal to KXY. And assume that we have a, a probability uh, distribution rho on X so that so phi x come norm square uh, with the, uh, the, the integral of this is finite, which is equal to k x x uh, integral of k x x equal x. So assume this is finite, then um, we can, and then we assume that we have a data set x here. Uh, that we can do this with um, m, m observation x one up to x m. Now with this feature map phi here will give uh, a, a, Informally, an infinite feature matrix of phi x and phi x one up to phi x m. But formally, formally is a modern linear operator. So it, it maps um, I m to H k. So it's given by this formula here. And so because of this, uh, because, because we assume that the, the, the second moment of phi x is finite, we can, uh, we can compute this uh, the theoretical mean, like the mu phi, just, uh, just the um, expectation of phi x, uh, the rho x, and the empirical It just mean it's just the That'll be the, the average of all the PXI, whatever I mentioned of the PXI, so it can, be, it can be written in this form as well. Now, if we have the linear kernel, for example, on a given space, and this, you know, this is new X here, just equal to the, uh, this is time for mean of the XI. So this is, a, we just like, instead of uh, summation of the XI, we just map XI to PXI. And this one will be also just in uh, expected value of X. And similarly, we can define also the covariance of the as well, the IPHS, so it map from HK to HK. And so this is 
kind of like VX plus VX transpose here. And then this is the empirical preference of the given the beta points, uh, X1 up to XM. So it's just a summation of um, all the VX, uh, VX, uh, the VX transpose actually. And then minus is mean that means transpose. So it's given in this form. Now in the, uh, in the linear tonal setting, uh, this just becomes a sample of progress matrix to one over M. Um, X actually M, X transpose. So sometimes we can actually use it one over M minus one as well, but I'm just going to use one over M for, for simplicity. Now, so if we are, if we define, uh, kind of, so we can define, uh, even a kernel, we can, uh, we can define like the goal of the RPHS progress put in this form. And then the distance between, uh, between the two RPHS uh, covariance operators can be given uh, close on formulas in the physical parametric. So we can come distance between like uh, CPX plus gamma I, uh, uh, and then CPX plus gamma I, uh, I can be given in, in closed form. So the, the, the kernel parameters are given with this like KXI for some of the KXIXJ. So now, okay, I, I, would not, uh, I would not go into the detail of the formula, just to show you that we have closed form formulas in terms of the, uh, in terms of the parameters. So everything can be computed in closed form. And so, so this actually has been, uh, well, it actually has been applied uh, in, in some kind of division class. And so this one is such a, for example, a two layer kernel machine for image classification. So here we start with the images and the features and so on, and then we uh, we extract the the features and we represent we apply the kernel of K one on top of the features, and uh, since K one induces a feature map, so we can define like a covariance operator using this using using K one. Now this covariance operator is defined implicitly, of course, and then uh, we can compute the log. So each image is represented, for example, by one covariance operator. And then we can compute the log in which the distance between these covariance operators, and we can compute the distance matrix, and we can apply a kernel K2. So this actually has been applied uh, both uh, we, uh, where, everything, where everything can be computed in closed form, and then it can also be approximated as well using the random Fourier features. So this is actually one way in which uh, these quantities can be, can be uh, computed, can, uh, can be applied in practice. So this is uh, the remaining distances. Now we also have um, divergences. So that's also the convex cone, open convex cone viewpoint of the set of matrices. And using this, we can define uh, the log weight of the divergences. So we have several families of uh, divergences. This one is called from the alpha log that divergences. So it's parameter, uh, parameterized by a uh, parameterized by a parameter alpha here. So it's given by this formula. But this is in general not, not symmetric. Uh, it's only symmetric when alpha is equal to one. And uh, alpha, 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 alpha is equal to zero. I'm sorry. It's only symmetric when alpha is equal to zero. When alpha goes to one, it, it goes to this limit, and when well, alpha goes to negative, it goes to this limit. Now this corresponds to the uh, to the Rennie uh, Rennie divergence between zero mid Gaussian uh, measures on Rn. In particular, this uh, alpha equal to one. This is the formula for the KM divergence between the two uh, zero mean Gaussian densities uh, on, on Rn. And uh, so now uh, we also want to generalize. We, we also want to generalize this to the integral dimensional setting. But how do we generalize this? Uh, okay, so let's talk about here. So we here we need to, we we compute the log net and so on. So we need to trace. So we need to talk about the trace class of we have a trace for example. And the log net is also closely related to the trace log net of H is equal to trace of log A. And if we have uh, the coefficients of the trace class of the so the, the Basically, if I self adjoin and come back and get infinity many I can believe, so they belong to the trace class if um, the summation of all the absolute value of the eigenvalues value is, uh, value 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 is less than infinity. And um, now, so the log that I just go to trace of log I, the function of all the log lambda k, so it will be negative infinity. So this is actually not well defined. Because all the lambda k goes to zero, so this is uh, negative, so it's not well defined. So we, we uh, need to consider like the set of operator A so that we can uh, and that we extend the function where we extend the function uh, trace and the determinants of that uh, this quantity is going to become finite. And so so one way to do it was actually before this is what is inspired by the kind of the extended uh, number Schmidt norm so we can also define the extended trace class operators and extended trace as well so we can define so Set of A plus gamma I where A is uh, beyond the chest class, so we can define the extended chest to the chest of, chest of A plus uh, gamma. So the chest of the identity, um, here the chest of identity operator is infinity, but if we define this form in the extended chest, it's equal to one. 
And we have something classically uh, called the threat home determinant for the determinant of A plus uh, gamma R, uh, um, A plus I, where I is an idea of the digital summation of the infinite product of one plus one by K. So this is always well defined, but we also want to define uh, the uh, determinant of A plus gamma I as well. So it's given in this form here. So we're kind of extending the, uh, the threshold determinant of the case when gamma is not equal to one. So now if we uh, do this, then we, uh, we can have uh, the, an infinite dimensional uh, formulation for the unphylogenic uh, divergence. So it's given by this formula. This is a simplified version of the, because I said like uh, here we have gamma I, gamma I here, because in general, this one is like gu I. So it's, it's the formula is more complicated. But in, in the uh, final dimension, in the setting, when, when these two, we have gamma I here, gamma I here, then the formula looks very similar to the, uh, the final dimension of the case. It has the same, basically a very similar form. And, and so if we do this, then we can also have a close some formulas in the RKG setting. And then actually the, well, that's also a little work in the uh, final dimension of setting in, in uh, incumbent provision. So that some people have been, uh, some people actually have done some work around uh, using kind of these divergences in the uh, other dimension of setting. And so, what does it does it make any sense? Now, does it make any sense to do to do this? Uh, we go, we have all kind of this uh, extended trace and so on. Does it make does it make any sense? So, we can show that we can we can show how it actually. So this is a we can show how it's actually related to the uh, to the Rene divergence and the Quebec lagrange divergence, the exact Rene divergence and the Quebec lagrange divergence uh, of the Gaussian measures on the Hilbert space. Now, on on RD, two Gaussian densities are always equivalent, so that they have the same they have the same support. Now, in in the if the dimension is infinite uh, on the Hilbert space with infinite dimension, two Gaussian measures are either equivalent or they are mutually singular, so they have destroyed support. So this is the famous theorem. It's called the feldman hajek theorem. And if they have the choice of bottom, the KM divergence is equal to infinity. So it's, it's, so it's actually, so it's very different from the final dimension of setting because in, in the final dimension thing, we have a closed sum formula and everything is always finite. This formula, is, the KM divergence is always finite. We have two Gaussian densities. So it's not the case in the infinite dimension of setting, but we can show, we can show now that if we have two equivalent Gaussian measures on a Hilbert space, and uh, the uh, perfect supporters are related in the, uh, related by this uh, are related by this formula. Then, when gamma goes to zero in the log net, for example, the case when alpha equal to one, we can see that gamma i is zero. That gamma it just equal to the uh, requires the k on divergence uh, between uh, between these two Gaussian measures. So we recover the uh, the k on uh, the k on uh, in general the Rene divergence. We can do equivalent Gaussian measures when the when the uh, regularization parameter goes to zero. So this is a form of uh, uh, regularize uh, form of regularization because we are trying to compute with the so instead uh, instead of the uh, the KM divergence for example we can compute with the regularized KM divergence and in the case they are equivalent then uh, when the, the regularization parameter goes to zero we recover the exact uh, the exact divergence and in the case of not equivalent then the um, divergence is equal to infinity and here is uh, expressed in terms of log net two because this one is something called the uh, common determinant is defined for Hilbert speed operator A given by this formula here. Okay, so that was the, and, and this formulation for our divergence is to be generalized um, quite substantially. So we have something called the alpha beta log net divergences, and it can be defined not just for just class operator, or positive just class operator, but in general for positive Hilbert speed operators as well, for the whole kind of manifold. And in particular, it involves, uh, it, the distance of uh, the divergence is actually in, uh, it encompasses the uh, not the alpha log net divergence I talked about just now, and also the um, uh, the phi and the Riemannian distance, and uh, they all induces the uh, phi and the Riemannian metric. So they all induce the same Riemannian metric. So that is uh, so that was the Riemannian distances and divergences. Um, now. I will talk about the optimal transport distances for so Zilla in, in a different, um, in, a, in a slightly different um, setting. So before actually kind of the distance and divergence are, are very closely related, actually they have like different formulas, but they're actually closely related. In particular, the, uh, as I said, like the div this uh, alpha log net divergence is in a, uh, alpha beta log net divergence all induce the phi in the demanding metric. So now let's, let's go to the uh, setting of optimal transport distances. 
uh, the probability measure. So this uh, now is a, is a hot topic in machine learning, but it's a huge topic in mathematics, of course, it has been studied a lot. So let's talk about, uh, I will just talk about the Gaussian setting. It's a very simple setting. Just, um, let's so let's suppose that X is a, a nice metric space. And so let's say X is a Haran. Let's just talk about Haran. And then C, um, X plus X, uh, R greater than equal to zero is the nice cost function. So let's talk about the case of this square function. Okay, just, uh, just consider the case of this square function, X minus Y non square. And, R. and so let's suppose that X is a set of all uh, probability measures from X. So the optimal transport problem between two, two probability measures, new zero and new one of the X is. Is given by this formula here, so we just minimize the ghost function C according um, uh, to the uh, to the joint uh, to, to a joint uh, measure between uh, between uh, uh, zero and new one. So we can see x y b gamma x y here. So so um, so new uh, gamma here without the joint new zero new one. We try new zero the side of joint probability is much more new zero new one. And uh, now on the set of uh, probability measures with uh, with finite moment uh, for the p, but the vp of uh, x zero x here uh, being less than infinity, then we uh, uh, then there's something called the p versus time distance. So just given by this uh, the, uh, ot uh, quantity here to the power of one over p. So this defines a metric on, uh, on the set of uh, probability measures, and it takes into account the, it takes into account the temperature of the underlying space x y or this distance uh, p on the on the space x now in the particular in the Gaussian setting is actually quite nice because um let's go to the two Gaussian measures in rn with uh, m1 and c1 um mici and square cost function so we can compute the, the cost on formula for this uh, uh the, the two versus time distance so it has to go something that it has been it was worked out by various authors a, a long time ago and in the case when the, the means are the same, we have something from the uh, the width versus time distance between SPD matrices. So let's give this formula here. And it has been also studied. Um, it has been also studied a lot in, in quantum information theory to, to measure the you know, the fidelity between two quantum states. You see, in quantum information theory, uh, we have a density uh, matrix which are um, SPD matrices with norm uh, with the trace equal to one. So this is also has uh, it also has uh, a Riemannian structure. So it's, uh, it's also um, it also has a Riemann. It, it also comes from a Riemannian metric if we assume that the uh, the matrix uh, the covariance are matrices are all uh, strictly positive. So the metric is given by this formula here, and the distance is the length of the following chain. So, so it also has a, a nice and close form formula. But note that this uh, distance here is a, in the in the general case. So C zero and C one is another. Do not have to be uh, strictly positive because uh, the choice is always well defined, uh, even if they are singular. So that's it. So this is the difference between the uh, uh, the versus time distance compared to the uh, to the um, fisher rao distance uh, or the the log of distance we talk about before all the divergences. Because before everything had to be strictly positive, and with this distance, uh, they don't have to be, the matrices can be singular. Now, so the nice thing about this uh, versus sign distance is actually in the infinite dimensional setting, the formula is the same. Uh, the formula stays the same because the chances are always well defined. We don't have to do the, we don't have to take the log or we don't have to take the uh, inverse. And so we don't have to do any regularization for that. Just everything is actually nice and fine. And then, so it has been kind of applied, we kind of study in the professor question process as well. Um, as, as I mentioned, uh, this Borel's uh, versus Stein distance between two covariance operators uh, is also valid for singular covariance operators as well. Okay, it has this, uh, of course, it's, it's not perfect because it has some you know, not desirable properties, for example, it's not officially functional. So now uh, let's move to the next uh, topic, which is entropic regularization of optimal transport. So in the exact optimal transport problem is generally computationally demanding, and uh, the exact uh, versus time distance can have a bad sample complexity. So it can be exponentially bad, which has been demonstrated by various uh, researchers. So this formulation called entropic regularization. Instead of computing just minimizing just the expected value uh, of C with respect to gamma, we also add like a, a, the k on divergence uh, between gamma and the product measure of mu and mu. So this one is actually the kind of the mutual information between mu and mu. And for okay, k is a compact level of divergence. And so this can be um, sold um, efficiently. And, um, and it, it turns out that it also like, gives actually uh, quite nice properties of the distance as well. Uh, in general, when, uh, when we add this term here, it kind of the, the, 
this OTC here become kind of biased because actually the OT epsilon between mu and mu is no longer equal to zero in general. So it's not a distance actually or divergence. So that's one way to do is kind of spin de biasing. So it's um, so instead of just like OT epsilon, we actually minus like a half of OT of epsilon mu mu and then uh, plus OT epsilon mu and mu. So this one would now become a divergence because it's guaranteed that uh, SS along like mu, mu is equal to zero. So it's, this one is from the Singham divergence. So it has been um, studied um, a lot, actually a lot recently. So in the, uh, in the um, Gaussian setting, let's, let's, uh, let's see how it works out in the Gaussian setting. So in the Gaussian setting, we have, so the formulas was worked out by various um, uh, authors actually, like, actually less than two years ago. So now with the square function, with the square loss of the square cost function and the Gaussian measures in RM, let's look at the KL, uh, this quantity here, KL divergence of gamma uh, and then mu zero product of mu one, this one is the mutual information. So it's given by the uh, H mu zero, H mu one minus H gamma, where this H here is a differential entropy. So we have this property called the maximum entropy property of Gaussian density. So if, X has mean zero and covariance of the occurrence uh, logic C, then the um, differential entropy is maximum when X is the, is the Gaussian, is, is Gaussian. And so now for this quantity, for this quantity to, 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 to minimize, so we need this to be maximized. So it has to be, so the, the minimum the minimizer has to be, the minimum gamma has to be a Gaussian density. It means a minimum Gaussian density. And so, Based on the maximum entropy property of Gaussian density, the minimizer gamma has to be a joint Gaussian density of mu zero mu one, and so we have like the close. We have a, a very clear, uh, an explicit form for gamma. It's given by this formula here, and this is the, the mutual information of the KM divergence. It's given by this formula here. So if we plug everything in, we can solve for this problem, and we have uh, the first one formula. This one is for the OT epsilon, and this one is for the uh, Singham divergence. So they have close on formulas. Uh, so this one actually it involves the n dimension and I mean our n dimension n here, but in fact actually it's actually it, it turns out that we can show that it's actually dimension independent in as we move to the infinite dimensional setting. So, so that is the finite dimensional setting. So here we have used the maximum maximum uh, entropy property of Gaussian densities. So now let, let's move to the infinite dimensional setting. So now we, are, we encounter something here, and we, we talked about the kind of determinant, the log that before. This quantity is no longer well defined because we have uh, we have an infinite determinant here, and all the eigenvalues are zero. So this is actually not very well defined. And uh, so if we have like the joint uh, Gaussian measure gamma here, for example, we had the same form as before, but the, before we have like the down divergence of gamma with mu zero mu one is given by this formula. This formula is no longer well defined the infinite dimensional setting, the, uh, as I said before, because of the infinite determinant here. But this, this the mutual information is the down divergence between gamma and mu zero mu one. Is, this is always well defined. It can be infinite, but it's always well defined. It's always, it's, it's always finite if gamma is absolutely continuous with respect to mu zero times mu one. Otherwise, it's infinite, but it's always well defined. And it can be shown that it can be shown that the kind of the you don't have to worry about the kind of the, uh, the math here, except that so in, in, in the infinite dimensions in, in the infinite dimension is something we can no longer talk about the maximum entropy property. We, what we can talk about is the minimum the minimum mutual information. That's what we can talk about. So suppose that we have like um, gamma zero here is a joint Gaussian measure, uh, Gaussian measure of mu x and mu y, and gamma just uh, another joint measure of uh, mu x and, and mu y. And so, uh, if they have the same covariance operator, then this uh, quantity here is always greater than uh, this quantity, and is given by this formula here. And equalities happen if only if gamma is equal to gamma zero. So the mutual information is minimum for joint Gaussian measures. And where this uh, V here basically, it just, uh, it just it's, uh, operator V here just relates to the uh, covariance operator of gamma and gamma zero, where gamma zero is the covariance operator of this uh, joint Gaussian measure gamma zero. And so as if the finite dimension is setting, uh, now with this minimum mutual information, we know that this has to be because we are doing minimization. So the minimizer has to be a joint Gaussian measure. And then if we plug this formula in, we can solve for this optimization problem. 
So this one is an infinite dimension optimization problem. Actually, but they can always it can be they can be they can be solved explicitly. Actually, can be solved. Can be solved directly, and we can obtain the solution. And uh, a different uh, way to do it is so, uh, something called we can uh, solve something called the Schrodinger system. So then we can uh, we can solve the the only capacity of this uh, gamma here. And so we can we can there are at least two ways to to, to solve for this. Uh, Solve the solution to, to, to find the solution, and so okay. So this is the solution here. So the uh, we can we can have a so we can have a, a closed sub formula for the minimizer gamma as well. And with this gamma, we have probably we find the the simple divergence. It's given this formula here. So it's actually um, it's uh, it's actually basically it has a set, it's equivalent to the Fermat's thing in, in the hidden setting, except that the determinant here is now in, is an infinity determinant. It's a Fermat determinant. And so when gamma goes to zero, when epsilon goes to zero, so we recover the exact Wasserstein distance. And when when epsilon goes to infinity, we just recover this mu zero minus mu one square. Okay. So now, so we can we can solve for uh, so we um we can have a uh, close sum formulas for uh, in, uh, for the Wasserstein distance and for the entropic version of the Wasserstein distance and the Sinkhorn divergence. Uh, um, as before, we can do it in, in the RPH thing as well. In the uh, suppose we have a two um, um, measures, uh, for our probability measure row one and row two on X, and we, they can induce, they will induce like two Russian measures. Before we introduce like, the RPHS mean vectors, mu and then C, so we can divide it, um, we can divide the single number between uh, these two Russian measures. And empirically, suppose we have two data set X, Y, sample from these two measures, and we can also compute the empirical single dimensions as well. And so uh, basically, so it gives like, uh, if we have a characteristic kernel, then basically it gives like the semi metric, single dimension, and the semi metric uh, between the two you know, measures. Now, so this is the, the formula here, it looks a whole over here, all over here, but it's just a formula for, to show you that you can have a closed form formula for the. In the, in the in terms of the bar matrix is um, and when epsilon goes to infinity we just get the uh, um, the, you know, the maximum mean discrepancy with this uh, the, the, the distance square between the two RKHS mean and then when uh, epsilon goes to zero then we have the Turner versus time distance the square of Turner versus time distance and so it's, it's an interpolation between the maximum mean discrepancy and the Turner versus time uh, Turner versus time distance so this is one way. So actually, it was, uh, it was actually applied. This kind of was a study was actually applied in uh, for common provision actually in, in the book uh, in the Vincent book. So that is uh, one way uh, to, to to compute this uh, um, directly. Now I want to talk about the the next uh, the next concrete uh, computation, which is kind of the uh, distances and divergence in the Gaussian processes. It was before it was a kind of the RPHS program, so let's talk about the question. Let's apply it to Russian processes. Suppose we have a, a nice compact matrix. Let's say the interval from zero to one, and, and mu is a nice probability measures on P. So the Gaussian process uh, uh, CT here in indexed by T is a collection of like random variables, a collection of random variables CT. Mean function mu and covariance kx, uh, kst. So kst is given by this formula, and, um, and mu t is given by this expectation of the CT. And so for each finite set x in t, uh, we have a random vector c, uh, xj, indexed by xj. So this is the random vector in Rn, and it's distributed according to a Gaussian measure. So it has like the, the mean here and the, uh, the, co or the covariance matrix kx here. But it's kx, just the gram matrix are defined on the set uh, x. And so now um, let's assume that uh, this um, function mu t here is square integrable, and then we have a t t here, d mu t less than infinity, so kind of similar to before. So according to um, according to uh, a result by uh, Rajput and companies a long time ago, 1972, uh, this formula is sufficient and necessary sufficient for the uh, for the following: the sum class of CR in L two t new almost sure. so there is square integrable almost surely. And that's a one to one correspondence between the uh, Gaussian processes GP mu k measure. And, uh, and the Gaussian measure would mean mu and covariance operator CK on, on the Hilbert space H equal to L2. 
with the governance operator, just integral uh, operator with the governor gate. So that's the one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, between uh, Gaussian processes and, and Gaussian measures. And uh, so what has to be, um, well, this is also a classic is what has to be careful about if the dimension uh, HK is equal to infinity, then the sample paths are actually outside of HK or both surely. So they do not lie in uh, in the uh, in the RKHS, such as they like outside the RKHS, but they are square integrable. So so now we can so we can actually think about the Gaussian process such as we are kind of sampled from this Gaussian measures on, on L2 D mu. We are sampled the function uh, CTR based on this uh, Gaussian measure on, on, on L2. And so now with this correspondence, we can define a Gaussian uh, distance of divergence between the Gaussian processes at distance of divergence between the corresponding Gaussian uh, measures. So there has been a lot of work actually uh, studying the distance of divergence between Gaussian processes. So uh, let's let's consider the case when we have the, the for simplicity. Let's consider the case when uh, mu is just equal to zero, mu one and mu two is just equal to zero. So then we just have the distance of divergence between uh, zero mean Gaussian processes or zero mean Gaussian measures. And so we can define, like for some of the log of the distance, we can define this uh, log of gamma i plus ck one minus log of gamma i ck two with the extended Hermitian norm. We can define the uh, fine gradient demanded distance. We can also define the Bose's fine distance and the Single divergence. So these are, of course, uh, this CK1 here and CK2 here are three dimensional uh, governance operators. So now we, are, we want to be able to, to estimate them. We have to, um, we have to estimate them from finite kind of dimensional versions. So now if we have like a finite, uh, and a finite set of X here, I'm sorry, this is M in, in T, and then we have, uh, then this vectors, uh, the, um, we have uh, CI of JXJ here, just distributed according to the uh, Gaussian measures with uh, zero mean and covariance which is KX. So we want to be able to estimate uh, this infinite dimensional formula from the final dimension using KXI. So it turns out that we can estimate them consistently by the final dimension of by the distance between, by the distance of divergence between the Gaussian measure with uh, uh, zero mean and also the covariance, uh, which is one over MK, one X. Uh, one of the antiques it works for all of the uh, distances and divergences we have talked about. So now, so these are quantities in RM because this is actually this uh, this uh, here I'm saying it's uh, it's a matrix of M M, so it maps RM to RM, whereas this is actually map L two to L two. So they are not exactly in the same space. They are not operated in the same space. So it's it's not straightforward actually to to compute the, the divergence. So what we are, uh, in, what we employ is something called the RKH. Uh, we are, because we are actually working with uh, this uh, this K one K two here kernels, and though they have uh, corresponding RKHs, we can define RKH, RKH and operators as well. So what we are going to do, we are going to prove the convergence using RKHs operators. Okay, so maybe I would just go out for this briefly because this one is a bit uh, requires too much information. Okay, so we can define the operator that can be uh, RK, uh, RK, for example, L2 to HKI, RKI to make this formula here. So it's quite similar to the, uh, uh, so, let's to this. so CK, CKI is just going to do RK transpose, time, time RK, but this RK transpose here is just the inclusion operator. So CK is given by RKI transpose and RKI. We can also define the cross covariance operator. Uh, RK, uh, RIJ, RK, 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 uh, transpose. So it maps HKJ to HKI, and we can define the RKHS covers for the uh, LKI to RKI, RK, 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 transpose. So these, so these two will have actually they look very similar, but they map onto different spaces. So basically, we will transform quantities using CKI, mapping from L2 to L2 to quantities using uh, uh, LKI, and also RIJ is a map from the RKHS to each other. And we can also, so now these, so these operators actually, quite, they have a lot of things come on, they have the same non-zero eigenvalues and the same traits and the same uh, number split norm, et cetera. And they have the same when we restrict, uh, when we, we restrict them to this, uh, the, uh, the space HKI, but in general, they are actually not interchangeable because we can define the distance between uh, N0, CK1, and 0 CK2, this is well defined, but this one for some between uh, zero LK1 and zero CK2 is not well defined in general because they belong to two different spaces, like LK1 and LK2 in general, they operate on two different number spaces, so they're not well defined. And then you can identify also define the empirical version as well, uh, based on uh, 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 data set X. 
okay? And in particular with the RK uh, I on a, on a set X here, it has the same eigen, uh, zero eigenvalues as the mean. That's just one of the MKIX. So we have this uh, one of the MKIX here, apply it uh, basically has the same eigen, zero eigenvalues as MKI. So we can represent basically the quantities using one of the KIX in, 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 of, in terms of uh, MKIX. Now, so with this cross coefficient operator here, they can, uh, we can apply uh, the law of large numbers for a human space. Run, uh, value random variables, we can show that they actually, the empirical version will convert to the uh, theoretical version with high probability. So now, in order to do this convergence, we need some form of convert, uh, uh, to, uh, we need uh, some form of convergence in, uh, in some norm. So one nice thing about the, the Shinkhan divergence and the, also the lock and the uh, five variant distance such that they converge, uh, they converge in the Himmelschmidt norm. So here, for example, the, uh, this is what the Singhan divergence. So, so if uh, we have two complex with a, uh, a sequence of program supporters AI, if they converge to A in the Himmelschmidt norm, then uh, we have a convergence in the Singhan divergence. Now, this is not the case with the Wasserstein distance. The Wasserstein distance converges in the chess class operator, uh, chess class form, which is actually uh, a stronger connection. We need a stronger convergence for the covariance supporter for the Wasserstein distance uh, to converge. And so if this actually has some consequences that we will see later on. So if we so we put the Himmler Schmidt norm, we can apply laws of large numbers to Himmler space random uh, Himmler space value random random variables to obtain sample complexity. So uh, so let's see now. So here we uh, we transform as you thought instead of we have like this uh, Singhan divergence here, for example, between operators in, uh, in L two and in, in R M. So here we transform them into. Uh, um, RKHS operators, so uh, mapping from, from HK1 to HK1, HK2 to HK2, and then HK2 uh, to HK2, and the same thing here. So we have, we, here we have like our quantities defined on the same spaces, so we can actually compute the convergence, convergence from here to here, convergence from here to here, convergence from here to here. So this is actually how the convergence is done, and we can show that the empirical version converges to the uh, um, theoretical version with high probability, and the convergence is dimension independent. And we can do the same thing for the uh, lock and machine distance and the, uh, and the uh, fine variant uh, remaining distance. Uh, but also the technical details are, are different, of course, because they are, they are different distances. So we have to have different uh, kind of representation using the RKHS and Proverbs and cross Proverbs and Proverbs. But kind of the idea is basically quite similar. Um, so we have the same kind of the, uh, sample, uh, I mentioned independent sample complexity, just the, the empirical version converging to the uh, theoretical version. Now, this is different with the with the Wasserstein distance because of the chess class uh, because we require the chess class convergence uh, for the Wasserstein distance to come. So we actually we um, we cannot apply like the, um, and the, the chess class norm is actually like the Babax space norm with uh, five one. So it's uh, the uh, I'm not aware of kind of like very good convergence results, uh, like a good law of large numbers for, for the chess class norm. So for the moment, I can show that the empirical uh, version converges to the exact to the theoretical version, but only in the case that at least one of the RKHS has a finite dimension. Otherwise, we can have the convergence, but not the rate of convergence. Okay, I would probably skip this because it's, uh, it's kind of too much. Because it's, we, uh, just to say that we can also. Uh, if the finite covariance matrix Kx is not known, then we can also estimate Kx from some finite samples as well, but this is not, uh, I would speak this part. We can just show that uh, if we uh, um, estimate the, the sample covariance, um, the, uh, the covariance uh, matrix is the finite covariance matrix from the sample data, we can, we can also uh, arrive to the estimation of the exact theoretical version. And here, uh, the dimension, the, the convergence is also dimension independent. So let's, Let's talk, let's see a little bit, a few, a few examples here. So here we have on the left hand side here, here we have like two Gaussian processes over here. here we have, the, so the covariance here, I just uh, negative a to the times uh, on the interval from zero to one, so x minus y, so the value a equal to one. This is actually a very, a very familiar example of the Gaussian processes. And on the right hand side, we have the, uh, the Gaussian uh, donor. And so the, the paths are very smooth. And here we show the uh, the KL divergence. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the fine variant and Lockheed Schmidt distance. So they kind of they both converging to, to some value here. 
And the same thing, uh, so the, uh, now here I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to similar Gaussian process. So we have the same, very similar kind of Jacobian function actually, so that we have, uh, so A here is equal to one, and A here is equal to one minus one over two. So they are much closer to each other. And so we have, um, we are converging to a much smaller value as we should expect. And here are the, uh, the example of the Bersestein, the Hindu-Schmidt and the Singhan divergence of the Bersestein, Hindu-Schmidt and Singhan divergence. So here are, we have the integral from zero to one to power d, where d equal to one, d equal to five, and d equal to 50. But see, we can see that here for the Bersestein distance, uh, we can see that actually we do not have the dimension uh, independent sample complexity because uh, they have a different behavior with, uh, when the dimension increases, but the, whereas the other one actually have very similar kind of behavior. So, um, so my, uh, so as I said, like I do not have the uh, convergence rate for the Wasserstein distance when both of the RKHS have infinite dimensions. And I think the dimension independent, uh, dimension independent convergence for the Wasserstein distance doesn't exist uh, because uh, this is uh, judging from the empirical values. Right? So to summarize, maybe this is uh, there's a lot of material. So we've talked about the generalization of the remaining distance between Gaussian measures of my random and the Schmidt setting. And then we talk about the uh, fine invariant remaining distance or the Fisher bar distance, the log of the distance, uh, the log determinant divergences. So in this, for this distance and divergence, the regularization of the uh, covariance of is theoretically necessary. And we talked about the versus time distance and its entropic version. And we can see that with the entropic regularization, it leads to uh, some very nice uh, theoretical properties. Just like sample dimension independent sample complexities. It has uh, some other nice, nice properties as well, apart from this dimension independent sample complexity. And many more theoretical results can be clear as well. And I have some upcoming work with the uh, car on, on the Kubek Leibler and Rene divergences uh, in Russian process, etc. I, I have just completed the manuscript, so it should be available uh, in the car pretty soon. And uh, future work, we have to move beyond Gaussian process. So, I'm sorry that the work, the, the, the talk has been kind of entirely theoretical, mathematical. That's not, uh, I haven't really shown any application yet. So hopefully in the future, we have like um, application, practical applications as well. Or if you have like some uh, applications, I would love to hear about them. And so here are some of the kind of the latest references. So we have some kind of uh, paper, some of some still review and some have already just been published. So uh, this is the end of my talk. Um, I would be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you Thank very you. much for this talk. I mean, uh, this is fantastic, actually. Um, now, if the attendees have questions, please use the Q&A box. I just would like to ask a couple of things. First of all, sure. this is almost like a cheat sheet for me that it would be great to have access to your slides. Uh, uh, sure, sure. This was, this was very, uh, it's a good compilation of these metrics and their implications. So I, I, I very much appreciated this work. Um, and you. you also mentioned very, uh, very interesting things about the, the, the Singhorn, the smoothed Wasserstein distance with the entropy, the Singhorn uh, having very nice theoretical properties and right. dimension independent. I mean, do you think that these kind of things can also be used? So let's talk about applications, as you mentioned, right, that right. In, in generative adversarial networks, um, we so. end up trying to um, we end up trying to minimize, for example, the Wasserstein distance uh, right. of an empirical measure with respect right. to a push-forward measure uh, defined by a neural network. Right. Now, there, the dimension is actually a curse, right? Because right. you don't have access to the true measure. You end up working with the samples, and there's a terrible dependence between the, the distance between the empirical samples to the true measure. Right. Now, do you think that we would gain advantages with the smoothed uh, Singhorn uh, kind of distances there? Do we get any advantages in analysis that you can think of? I I would expect so. I would expect so. Well, it's, it's not clear actually, until we do it actually. So it's, it's not we cannot really say for sure and, and, and unless we, we actually do the, the the actual experiments. But I would ex I, I would expect so. And I I I um I think I'm not quite sure whether somebody has tried it. Um, and then they, there must be, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there are it's also possible. some experts in the audience, like I think Taiji is in the audience. Right. I, I, I think it, I think somebody it. probably has. I, I, maybe it has been. I don't know. I have to check actually, because um, I, I have not done like I have not really kind of um, 
done any 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 experience like that. So I think it's I think we have to do it to, to really know actually whether it, it really does help in because actually in optimization it also does help uh, yeah. the smoothed because then you have a differentiable distance right and yeah I mean so uh, yeah. So it becomes is, much more, it becomes much nicer actually with the with the with the entropic regularization because it becomes like uh, also like strictly convex and it also like the uh, the um, the very center problem actually becomes like uh, much better well defined actually. And, actually, that uh, is correct because I, I remember Marco Chaturi had this work on smoothing with the entropy and then running the accelerated gradient method on the the primal problem to gain computational advantages. So there are, there are many things that right. we can do. Like, uh, I think very interesting set of, um, I would, again, uh, not to diminish anything, but it's like a cheat sheet of, uh, um, you know, like good distances uh, <laughs> and where to find them, you know? It's, uh, right. Right. <laughs> it's very nice. Well, thank you, thank you. So is there any questions from the audience? So I, um, I have a nice question. So, so let, let's take the first paper here. So which one? Infinite mm -hmm. dimensional Gaussian measures. Oh, uh, okay. For for Einstein distance. So how how do you really compute in practice? So I still didn't really get that part. Oh, so for example, like with this uh, with this Gaussian, uh, like if we, we if we know the if we know the uh, if we know the um, if we have like the Gaussian measures, which uh, are the to Gaussian processes, for example, we can compute using the. Uh, if you think you think you think this approximation for example, like kind of dimensional version here, we can so so if we have if we so if we know uh, if we know k one k so if we have like, so for each custom processes might correspond to we have a one to one correspond to custom measure right, and then if we know if we know the the covariance uh, uh, matrix for example on a finite uh, set x we can compute the empirical version so this is. Uh, this is like a, a consistent approximation of the exact, of the exact, uh, of the theoretical uh, distance. So basically, this, computation is done in a, like an empirical kernel space, even right, though so, the so, entire space is infinite dimensional. Right. So so yeah, so practically we have we, we cannot compute the uh, we, we because we do not know actually in fact we do not know the uh, the the, the, covariance, like the exact covariance of particles like we do not know them. So we have to compute if we know them exactly, and we, we know all the eigenvalues, and we can so we can compute that we have the because we have the exact formulas, so we can compute like the trace. For example, I'm sorry, let's go to the formulas. Uh, we can compute like the uh, we can compute like the trace. If we know all of these exactly, we can compute the eigenvalue and so on. And then we can compute like the uh, the trace and so on, and the, the log determinant and so on. But in general, we do not know them. Like, Analytically, right? So we have to compute them practically. We have to, to, to use estimation. So uh, empirical estimation. Empirical well, estimation. Huh? Right, right. Empirical estimation. I but see. actually, with the with the sample, with the uh, with the uh, I mean, with the with the sample, like with the convergence, for example, they actually they, they have like uh, dimension independent convergence. So they got, they all converge actually kind of uh, kind of nicely, I think. Um, but of course, we have to. Um, uh, we have to see how we like how how they can actually how they will work out actually kind of in real situations because here like we we kind of uh, here the here the synthetic examples because I assume that I know the covariance function. Oh uh, well, we can uh, if we have like sample data, for example, we can also compute using sample data. We can but we, we, we have to estimate the, the covariance function of course. Mm. So in, in high, high level, so empirical approximation is usually used for like converting the you know, true expectation to empirical average. Right, but right. in this case, also it com converts infinite dimensional calculation into finite dimensional calculation. Right, right. right. So we have the mm. convergence graph. I see. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's clear now. Right. So, so we always have to start from the finite dimensional setting, actually, because uh, we always have because there's always like a limiting process actually, when we do the computation. There's always a limiting process from the uh, from the finite to the infinite dimensional because uh, really we cannot compute with the infinite dimensional setting. Right? We cannot like. Practically, we can have compute. <laughs> Thank you again uh, for the answer. Like I said, it would be great to have access to these slides somehow. Sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. I, yeah, I, uh, I, yeah. I, I think I think we can make them available. I can send you personally as well. I can, I can no, send you. Thank you. you, thank you, well. thank you. I, I will make it available to EPFL community at sure, least. Uh, sure, sure. So, anyway, the talk video and slide will be open to the public. Oh yes, on uh, the the weekend site, no? Right. Fantastic. Okay, so I think this concludes our uh, talk for today.
thank you, Min, uh, again for this fantastic talk. Thank you very and much. Thank, uh, everybody for joining in for this talk. Uh, have a great evening in Japan and uh, have a great day in Lausanne.